And I'd like to welcome John Henry Parker and William Rodriguez to our conversation tonight. And I'm wondering if we could start by perhaps you, John Henry, introducing yourself and saying a little bit about what brings you here. I co-founded an organization called veteransandfamilies.org in 2003 with my son after he came back from two tours in Afghanistan. And um, unfortunately, he passed away about three and a half years ago from a motorcycle accident during homecoming. And we, I got together with a bunch of parents and family members, and we started looking at what was going on with uh, the catastrophic losses of motorcycle accidents and suicides. And uh, it's just so out of control, we decided to repurpose what we were doing and rename the organization to Purple Star. Just like in the military, there's a gold star, Mothers of America, which is for uh, mothers and families who've lost their, their, their veterans in service, their children. And then there's a blue star organization for families whose families are serving, whose uh, veterans or military personnel are serving. But there wasn't a star organization for families going through homecoming and like our family, families whose veterans weren't surviving homecoming. So we started Purple Star, and what I've been doing is uh, working with veterans like, like William and others to look at what's going on with decompression, what's going on with homecoming, and what's going on, as importantly, for the family members. Because uh, after my son did two tours in Afghanistan with the 10th Mountain Division, I mean, I never heard anything from anybody suggesting what we might be expecting when they when he came home because i know there's a you know there's a lot of preparation in somebody coming into the army getting ready for deployment and going into deployment and as they begin to come home but there's really nothing helping them really transition from military into the home life as i understand it well unfortunately there's there are some programs in the works and they're isolated there are a lot of good programs like even your research is gaining a lot of traction in the military but there's nothing standardized in to this day, what we typically hear is there's a, a, a TAPS or an ACAPS program, which is a transition assistance program, which focuses on your benefits, your, uh, your you know, civilian employment ideas, maybe something about your financials. But there's nothing, as, as Charles Hogue, he's an author of Once a Warrior, Always a Warrior, he clearly states that the programs aren't addressing the, the key contributors to suicide and hopelessness, which are you know, grief, loss, rage, you know, retribution, depression, alcohol, drug abuse. These are all major factors that need to be considered in, in all the underlying issues that are going on with it. So I have a question uh, which I'd, I'd like to put out, but and then I'd like to get uh, William's uh, introduction, but the one I'd like to put on the table is if you had your dream wish, and it's the same thing for you, William, uh -huh. if you had your dream wish of what a person would go through in making that transition, what kinds of things would they be offered that would help both the, the person who's coming out, but their families, their children, as you said, their parents, their grandparents, the whole kind of network that is their support system. So in a minute, I'd really love to put that one on the table, that kind of wish list. Love to talk about it. Great. Yeah. So I'd love you to introduce yourself, if you would, William. Well, I'm William Rodriguez. I'm a three-time Operation during Operation Iraqi Freedom veteran. Uh, I served uh, for uh, over six years with the 101st Airborne Division. I was a recon scout in the, in the military, and I had a lot of a lot of homecoming difficulties myself and coming through, and uh, I was really lost upon separation and, and homecoming, and uh, so I thought, well. I got to get some education on this, so I started studying psychology, and I, I wanted to, I wanted to kind of figure out myself, and and uh, in turn maybe if I could if I could figure out some of the problems that I was going through, that I could spread that information to other people and and, and help soldiers that were coming back themselves, and uh, just as I had graduated with my my undergraduate undergraduate degree, I. Uh, USC had started up a, a military social work program. It was the, the first of its kind in the country uh, to focus on post-traumatic stress, homecoming, traumatic brain injury, and that sort of thing. And uh, I was blessed enough to be part of their inaugural class. And uh, when I was, when, just as I was graduating, 
I was uh, thinking, okay, there's got to be something else. It, it can't just be go to the VA or, you know, th there's got to be something else. So I was looking into starting up my own nonprofit. And then, uh, you know, the burden of, of, of dealing with my own, my own post-traumatic stress and then counseling other soldiers and their families, uh, kind of, I, I put up a lot of walls. Right, I put up a lot of walls and then tried to intellectualize a lot of things, you know, and uh, those walls came crashing down and I, I was the one that, that needed help. And um, so uh, I was going through my things and I was looking for programs and uh, I, uh, I, met a, I met a woman at the uh, California State uh, Veterans Affairs Office and, uh, um, or the Congressional Office at, in Sacramento and uh, she gave me John Henry's name. And uh, I, I uh, talked to him for a little while and uh, I found out what he was doing and uh, it was exactly what I was, what I was looking into. Uh, there needed to be something done for education of the families and include the families because they are, they are the safety net for, for returning soldiers. And uh, so I started looking into his organization a little more and uh, I thought, well, here's my opportunity. Here's my opportunity to get out there and really try to uh, educate some people on, on some of the issues that are going on with today's veterans and uh, really make a difference, make a difference. And if, you know, so and that's kind of led us to talk to a lot of great people and, and get a lot, of, a lot of good perspectives. And uh, so. When, when you were just starting out uh, in that uh, description you just gave, you said you had a lot of difficulties in separation. Mm -hmm. So I'd love it if you might comment, and this might lead into the wish list question, but um, can you say a little bit more about what it's like in that moment of separation? Because I get the hint you're separating from something, but now you're coming home and I get the feeling you're feeling separate. Yeah, yeah. So when you, when you separate, uh, there's a it's a feeling of uh, identity loss, right? Like uh, I was an NCO, and I was at, at 24 years old. I'm in charge of I'm in charge of other soldiers' lives, and I, I have uh, this terribly dangerous job that just sounds really cool. And uh, I, I kick in doors, and and uh, and and you know, you, you kind of hold that nobility, and then when you leave, you lose that sense of identity, and then there's that sense of now what? And the reason I chose to separate is uh, I, I had two daughters, uh, both of them were born while I was overseas at different times. And uh, it was, it was becoming a choice of uh, do I have a family and try to raise these children? And uh, you know, I, I haven't seen any of my children born. Uh, and uh, my my youngest, I, I got to listen to her be born while I was sitting on the tarmac waiting to fly to Iraq. And, and then I seen her for the first time when uh, she was a few months old. Uh, and you just have to kind of take these things and put them aside and, and focus on the task at hand. You know, you, you are in charge of uh, other people's lives and, and you have to keep yourself alive all in the same thing. So, uh, you know, it, it was, okay, there has to be something else. I, I can't continue to, to put my family through this. When you get out and you have a job like a like a reconnaissance scout or an infantryman or an artilleryman. Um, there's not there's there's not very much crossover, right? Uh, so I, I got offered a, a lot of a lot of money to go overseas as a private contractor and do mercenary work and that sort of thing and security. But once again, it's taking me away from my family, so it wasn't it wasn't fitting. Um, and there's nothing in the local newspaper that says wanted strong guy that can shoot well and carry heavy rucksack. You know, there, there's, <laughs> there's, no, there's nothing for that. And, uh, you know, I just felt lost. I, I, I felt completely lost. Yeah, because you, you used the word uh, nobility. Mm -hmm. So when you were in the service, there was a feel, feeling of doing a job and it had nobility to it. Mm -hmm. But I get the sense then in transitioning out, there's a loss of that sense of nobility. Yeah, yeah, and you kind of, because you, you go into it at such a young age, and you, you're, giving, you're given so much responsibility at such a young age. I mean, this was all happening, I'm 24 years old, I'm 24 years old and I'm on my third combat tour, you know, 25 years old, third combat tour. You know, and uh, I'm, I have a squad of, of eight to ten guys a at a time who, you know, and that's, that's a whole emotional sp experience as well because these aren't just an eight people that, you know, that signed up for this. Like, you know, before you leave, you know, you have to talk to them.
their mother and look her in the eye and say, I'm going to bring him home. Don't worry. You know? And when that doesn't happen, uh, you have so much guilt and you have so much, so much burden placed on you. But at that time, um, you kind of have to put everything else aside and believe that you can do this task. That, that you're invincible. There's an air of invincibility that has to be there in order for you. Because if you actually were to be mindful of the situation that you're in and to say, okay, you know, here I am surrounded by bad guys and there's only a few of us and we might not make it, then you probably won't. You have to have that shield of that armor of saying, no, no, nothing's going to happen. We're, we're going to all get through this. You know, no matter no matter how many bombs go off, no matter how many rounds get fired, uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna make it through this. And uh, so you you put up these barriers, you you have these false beliefs, and then you know the more time you have to reflect, you know, after everything's all said and done, then that's when the realization of of what you were actually doing really starts to take hold. You know, so. So I'm, I'm wondering this word invincibility, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you find yourself back home right. and that moment of transition. So I'd, I'd love to come back and visit that question, which is if you had a wish list, what would you like to be having happen to make this transition from such a, a noble adventure that they're living out and this quality of invincibility and the tremendous responsibility that's being put in their hands mm -hmm which most 20, 21, 22, 23-year-old kids don't have. Right. And all of a sudden they find themselves at home. Tremendous loss. Yeah, and it, it, what's interesting is the, the families, less, less than one-half of 1% 1 of the United States you know, citizens have even served in the military. So for the most part, we're not qualified to be handling traumatized combat veterans when they get home. But yet... When they, when they get out, they're not really prepared for what's really going to happen. And so I'll answer your question in two ways, one for the parents and families, one for the veterans. The, the challenge we have with, with spouses, and there are some spouses in the room here, um, and military moms and dads and grandparents, and I can tell you from personal experience, there's nothing worse than the need to be needed as a parent but being helpless to help. You, you have no way to understand what do you need? What can I do for you right now? You know, and they're not going to tell you. They're going to. Well, luckily, my son told me a lot of things, and we we were different than a lot of families. I was in the Marines. My dad was in the Marines. I was a peacetime Marine. My dad was a combat vet. So the families needing to understand how to be prepared before their veterans get home is probably the most important thing. And there's nothing standardized. You have little towns and cities. Like San Diego is a great place for lots of big coalitions. There's other veterans coalitions around the country in Sacramento, and they're learning their way through this about how to come together as a community. But there's so much of the rural areas that are these guys and gals go back home, and there's no safety net. There's, they're miles or hours away from the closest VA. So the first thing on the wish list would be to have nationally standardized homecoming preparedness resources that are readily available for families. It's where everybody hears and sees the same thing, a best practices model, you know, world class, like what are we, what's everybody doing? Not just a bunch of brochures, there's just, there's so much lacking. From the veteran side and from the family side, peer mentoring. Like veterans won't talk to anybody but another veteran about the real stuff. And we know that, everybody knows that. So peer mentoring programs are taking hold uh, throughout the VA and the defense, center, defense centers of excellence and Probably the most important thing is the full-fledged development, and we've got we've got just so many Vietnam-era veterans that have been through homecoming. A lot of them still aren't home, and they're willing to mentor, and their spouses who have been military family members. So we've got a ready-made mentoring, you know, legions of mentors that would be willing to get homecoming right this time, and then you've got from the first Gulf War to post 9-11 veterans who would jump on the fact that a peer mentoring certification program to get them on base to talk to veterans about, hey, I know you've been successful in the military. It won't necessarily translate to when you get home. Here's what you need to know firsthand. That would be, if we just did that right off the bat, I think we would start dropping the suicide rate.
I, I notice you've got some statistics here. Yeah, yeah, and it's staggering. And it, it's horrible. Uh, a lot of people who work with veterans on, on a daily basis understand the statistics. And uh, when I first started um, advocating, I guess, uh, I was quoting 18 suicides per day, 18 veteran suicides per day. Uh, and since the VA came out with the new research, uh, it's come up to 22 suicides per day. So it's not going down. It's, it, it's going up. There was 150,000 Vietnam veterans that our names didn't make it on the wall who died of their own hand after they got home. Uh, so this isn't, this isn't a new story. This is an old story that's been neglected and overlooked for, for a long time. Uh, veterans are five and a half more times likely to die in speed, high speed related accidents. 88% uh, college dropout rate within the first year. One in four homeless men are, are veterans. When my son passed away, I started looking around for other families of uh, motorcycle accidents and, and, uh, and suicides and just the fatalities, and I couldn't find any other families. You find lots of obituaries. Okay, and I'd had to track them down by their name, look for their hometown, find their home phone number, call around, call the reporter, and it was just arduous. And so, so we've got a way to start building that base. But w what, I'm f what we're finding is that when, when veterans get home, there's this huge barbecue where we all celebrate and the whole neighborhood knows about it. And they celebrate and next thing you know, when our veterans getting in trouble with the law or they're getting a DUI or they're having domestic violence problems, it's not okay as a dad or a mom to tell anybody in the community that your hero's having a problem because it'll dishonor them. You're afraid that you're going to have a conflict then with your veteran, so nobody says anything. So what people hear is, I'm fine. What we hear from our veterans is, I'm fine. And families suffer in silos. And so for the last 10 years, I've been asking families, well, how many other families do you know in your same neighborhood that are going through homecoming? And it's usually zero to very few. So what we really see is there's no community. And as long as we're individualized, we have not got, we have no ability to change the way we do homecoming. It's, it's a real paradox as well, because mm -hmm. in, in, in basic training, you're broken down as an individual and, and brought back up as a, as a unit. So you're taught and then the battle buddy system becomes crucial, right? You never go anywhere alone. You always have a battle buddy. But then when you're out, you don't have a battle buddy. You're by yourself. And so, you're, you're stuck in, in, in unfamiliar territory. And it's very, very difficult to, to wrap your mind around that. Like, okay, now I'm on my own. And the military does a wonderful job of, of preparing soldiers and training soldiers. And uh, to get to your question of what would, a, what would the perfect scenario be, well, I think we can, we can uh, I, I don't know the answer to that. But I think a lot of the, a lot of the evidence can come from battlefield medicine. If you, if you get injured, regardless of how bad it is, there's over a 90% chance that you're going to make it home. Whether that's a good idea or not, well, that, that's debatable. But uh, they've made tremendous strides in battlefield medicine. And uh, I believe we're the most, uh, we're the, we have the most ingenuity in the world. Uh, that we have dedicated academics and people that actually care and research this, that uh, there's enough evidence out there that uh, if, if the subject matter experts could sit down at the table and all come up with a collective solution, I, I think we could figure out something that's uh, a lot better than, than 22 suicides right, a day. Right, so you're talking about homecoming medicine. Yeah, yeah, well, just, just some sort of decompression. I, I believe, personally, that little psychological tools, such as trigger identification and, and, these, and these sorts of things, uh, just teaching guys, hey, if you become triggered, just go, go you know, separate yourself, take a few deep breaths, maybe you, somebody you trust, talk to them, let them know, you know, go into support, instead of always having that adapt and overcome mentality. Because you get into that, well, no matter what the situation is, because you teach people, right? You teach people that have to endure some of the most harsh situations that a human being can actually go through that regardless of how bad the situation is you find a way and you figure it out and you get through it and then when you separate you have the VA who does a tremendous job and, and, and work is doing what they can with what they have and but it's still a volunteer service so these same guys that you told to adapt and overcome and just to make it now have to stand up and say, 
I need help. That's the catch-22 that, that we want to address with Purple Star. We've got a national petition right now that we're, that we're gaining momentum with across the country, and it's really about a catch-22 that exists. We train our military to get the job done or die trying, but the only way to get services when you get out is to ask for help. Well, the people who need it the most aren't asking for it, and everything is voluntary only for mental health services. So what we're doing is in the petition, we're the two parts of it, one of them I've already covered, nationally standardized homecoming preparedness for family members. The first part of it, though, is um, comprehensive homecoming preparedness and decompression training for military personnel before they separate, while they're preparing to leave the military. And uh, I just wrote a chapter for a book, and I, and I remember naming part of the title. You know, if you're going to go duck hunting, when do you load your guns? When you see the ducks? I mean, you don't grab your pocket full of bullets when they're flying off, right? And so that's kind of what we're doing, is waiting for them to get home to see what happens. And so we think by prevention and early intervention, giving them the tools they need, and one of the reasons why we're here is to experience something. What is iRest? What is integrative restoration? And how can we use it for our own health, develop our own capacity? So, so let me investigate that a little bit. Uh -huh. So you've been here for four days. Right. And going through this training for the first time. Mm -hmm. And so I'd, I'd love to get your reflections on, one, how is it just the training for yourself, so personally, mm -hmm. and then how do you see it as a work you might be carrying out and how it might be beneficial uh, in these kinds of situations you're talking about? Please, please. Well, um, I, uh, I had no... Um, no real knowledge of yoga or anything else when I came here, so I had a bunch of I, I was ignorant to a lot of, to a lot of facts and uh, I, had, I had done uh, a little bit of study on it and uh, since I got here, the concepts make so much sense it 's like taking a whole bunch of evidence based practices and throwing them into one model right you have elements of 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 cognitive therapy you have exposure therapy you have mindfulness you have meditation you have all all these things that have proven to work and in a 4000 year old model right going back to the past to find the answers to the future and uh for me it's 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 been completely eye opening uh you know coming in fresh and and just saying okay well I'll, I'll see how it goes and uh you know i i came up here and i thought i i i thought okay now would be a good time to quit smoking and uh that's been a a, a wonderful side effect of this process mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I haven't had a cigarette since I've been here, and, and uh, I, I don't think I, I don't think I ever will. Uh, and uh, so, I, I think that by being able to integrate all the pieces into the whole is is the dream of, of of any human right to be a fully functional human to understand all the elements of themselves so i i think i think the concept is wonderful and i think the more people uh start to use it and and start to understand it and get over maybe some of the stigma that they may have i i, I think that it, it can really make a difference i i really do um so I, i'm i'm very grateful to be here and to have experienced this and with such a wonderful group of people from a variety of backgrounds. I mean, we have people here from, you know, a whole multitude of disciplines and bringing in various perspectives on, you know, from where they're from and, and everything else. And it's really just been an eye-opening experience and, and I, I really am grateful. I'm, I'm definitely blessed. So, so you, were, you were mentioning the, the various components of the program of IREST mm -hmm. and how they're bringing together different efficacy-based um, elements that have already been studied, but mm -hmm. it's in one component package. Mm -hmm. And then you talked about a sense of your own integration. Yes. I wonder if you might comment on that, how the process that you've been going through as you've been learning this, um, both for yourself but also as a teacher, how might you comment on how has it affected you in that integrative manner? I think one of the most beneficial uh, aspects of the training is knowing that anybody can do it. It's a human-to-human -human training. You don't need all these special skills and licenses to do it. You sit there and, and you, you reflect questions and you ask and, and, you, and you're just genuinely honest. And I, I think the outcome is empowering to the individual. 
right? The, the, the object of a good therapist is to work themselves out of a job, right? That, that's, that's what we all should be doing. And so to be able to, to, be able to sit there and l to know that they came up with the answer themselves, right? It, it, it's, it's tremendous for self-efficacy and empowerment and that you don't need anybody else. You just need to be able to talk and open up your feelings and, and, and just to have a true conversation about what's really going on instead of always trying to wear these masks, you know, or depending on somebody else to do it. And I, I think that's the most, most beneficial part, you know. So a, a soldier seeing an IRS video on, on TV and, and learning some of the, you know, the sacred mirror that, that you referred to, uh, learning some of those techniques and can look at another soldier and say, hey man, I understand, you know, why don't we sit over here and have a talk? You know, that, that conversation might save that soldier's life. You know, you, you, never, you never really know, so. Well, there, commenting on that, you're, have you had to disclose anything of your experiences here this week? No, and, and that's the... That's, that's probably the most important element is that you're saying just be honest and open, but there's not a need with, with the integrative restoration process for you to disclose the details of an experience. It's just not happening. Right? Yeah, you know, and, and that's that I, I find that a lot and, and it's something that I've always thought was, was fairly unethical. Uh, like statements and forms, right? They want to know what happened. What was your trauma event? You're sitting in your living room and you're filling out this form and you're thinking of these horrific incidences and you're by yourself. Right? You have to unpack all this, and it's up to you to repack it back in. Like I have, you know, I, I've, I've had uh, uh, several experiences, I think, that'll last with me forever. And, uh, you know, I, 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 w I was pretty, pretty comfortable with them, and then I just had to fill out one of those forms. And I believe I'm, I'm fairly strong when it, when, it, when it comes to, you know, understanding and accepting and just knowing that everything happens for a reason. But, uh, you know, I, I was... I was in pretty bad shape for a couple of days after that. Uh, you know, I started smelling the smells again, and you know, things just so slowly started to creep back. So, as you've been going through the training, mm -hmm. you're both learning how to teach it and work with another, but you're yeah. also participating in it, so you're you're experiencing it for yourself. And John Henry, you were just talk, uh, commenting where, during the process, we're not asking people necessarily to say what's going on inside them but to, to learn how to be with the experience. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'd love it again if you'd say more about how it was or how it is going through these processes where you have the opportunity to speak what may be mm -hmm. important to say, but mm -hmm. you're also being supported to not speak if that's something that doesn't want to happen. Yeah, because it focuses so much on inner reflection, right? It focuses so much on, on internal reflection, and you're sitting there and weighing out the opposites and understanding where there's evil, there's good, right? And, and so I, I think that not having, having the, the flexibility in the program to work at your own pace and not being so invasive you know, and to, and it's, it's, it's self-regulated as, as I start to feel more comfortable, maybe more information will flow. But if I'm not ready for that, I can still, I can still utilize some of the methods in the protocol. So I'm finding this, it's just fascinating that no matter what type of trauma or what type of problem we may have, there's a story to it, but then there's also how it shows up in our body. Mm -hmm. And for me, the biggest impact has been, I've been looking at therapies and healing modalities for many, many, many years. Well, my son and I started researching this back in 2003, look, and going through all different types of programs, and I actually had to unpack some things and leave it outside the door all week long because it wasn't necessary to get into the big, long story because what was going on for myself and for the people I was interacting with is, yes, they have a story, yes, they have trauma, yes, they have bad experiences, but they could also identify very quickly and easily where it's showing up in their body to know that it's there, but focus on the feeling and where it's at in your body, and then to be able to move that energy or that feeling to different, do, using different questions and different processes, it was incredibly helpful, and it was very quick. And I noticed a difference in how I was feeling and the people I was working with. Almost instantly, I could observe a change, and then coming back and, and, and just doing the work, you, you could see that there was a, an evolution in their thinking, how they were holding it, they were looking and feeling better, they were breathing differently, and they started commenting that they felt better. You know, and I experienced the same thing. 
So, uh, William, did you have some of the similar experiences? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I certainly did. Uh, as you all know, when I, before I came out here, I was, I was going through my own struggles, and then uh, I was uh, uh, lucky enough to come here and have uh, wonderful, wonderful, caring people to kind of open up to and, and share experiences with, and uh, at, 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 my own, at my own pace and my own comfort. And I, I started noticing right away that, that uh, my anxiety level was was dropping significantly. I, I I purposely didn't bring any of the medications that that I had been given, uh, and uh, I I haven't needed them. I I've been uh, my hypervigilance is is basically gone uh, since I've been here. You were talking earlier that a vet doesn't want to talk to anybody but a vet. They feel like that's the only person who's going to understand them. So in our gathering here, we do have a number of veterans, but. Most of the dyads, most of mm -hmm. the groups that you've been participating in, I'm assuming, and you could tell me wrong, are not vets. So you're you're getting a um, an ability to sit with people who don't have that same shared experience. And I'm curious um, because a lot of veterans, if they're watching this, they're going to be wondering what it's like to sit with someone who doesn't have my experience. Can they really understand me? Can I really felt understood? Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think civilians uh, play a wonderful role in in the in the treatment of of, of the mental health conditions of, of returning veterans. Um, however, some of the some of the gory stories, some of the the real war stories, uh, sometimes your hell is too hot. Your hell is too hot, and and it, it's best just to it's best just to keep that aside. And you know they'll they'll I've noticed a lot of veterans opening up uh, to civilian counselors and, and and them having wonderful results. But some of the really really uh, uh, difficult things are, are are maybe maybe best left for uh, other veterans. You know, and uh, you know here it didn't require. Any of those stories, it didn't. It didn't require you to have to have to go into detail and 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 have to relive all that experience. It was more focused on on acceptance by other human beings and understanding that you know w it's 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 going to be okay no matter what, and that the other people do care, you know. And I, I think that's I think that's a it's a very very powerful tool. Mm -hmm. Anything you want to comment on that? Well, I think that um, you know the lack of lack of disclosure. You know, you don't have to disclose all, very much at all to get a, a pretty effective result. Um, as we as we talked early before we came to the training, obviously we need more veterans like William to come through the training, and eventually have you know groups of veterans training and imparting the work to other veterans. Because right now you've got great uh, CDs that they can listen to in the privacy of their own home or wherever they're at. They don't have to be around anybody. It's confidential. It's self-paced. Uh, if they want to go online, look at the IRS, you know, US website, they can see lots of research that should give them evidence that something's happening here, and that real veterans are actually using it and getting a result. The results you got at Walter Reed, where they were scoring and ranking IRS higher than other modalities. There's so much evidence that says this is working that I think that's going to start having an effect. But we really need to get groups of veterans going through so that way it's starting to propagate. The one thing in the military is it has to self-propagate. You can have all the research in the world. It's just like when Oakley sunglasses first came out and all the special operations guys had them. Every private who couldn't scrape up 50 bucks found 150 bucks to go buy a pair of Oakleys because it was the thing to have, right? And there's all kinds of things in the military that will point to self-propagation. So. This is strong enough and simple enough and good enough for self-care. Once you learn it, you can certainly help your buddy, but you can also work on it yourself to reframe what's happening in an instant. And that's really what I came here looking for was how can we find tools where when you get triggered, you can collapse a time frame from when you get triggered to when you recognize it down from hours or days to minutes and seconds and then nanoseconds to where you can collapse, you can make the, the episodes shallower and shorter and far fewer and farther in between and that's where life happens you know, not living in your triggers you know and that's what unfortunately what's going on is that they either go really deep in depression or they get charged up and they go somewhere else but there is a beginning and an end to an episode and what I see is when body sensations come up 
and you've got some tools like iREST, you can actually see where is it at, what's going on, what's happening, and you've got a strategy. And that's what I think is the most important here. And for families, I mean, I've talked to thousands of families, and, you know, as a rule, it's typically the moms who are more stressed out and freaked out. The dads are like, I'm going to go work on my truck, you know. They're, they're, they're going to go do something to occupy themselves. But there's dads that are more occupied and involved than others. But as a rule, I see a lot of moms are like, he's suffering more than I'll ever suffer. And they show up and they keep their strong face on. They, you know, they get their mama bear on, as, as we call it, right? And they're there to show up. And they're stressed out. They're getting on meds. They're, they're gaining weight. They're just like, they're just in a total fit over their, the homecoming of their kids. And we need self-care tools. I mean, people are stressing out, and uh, and all they can say at the end of the day is, "I'm uh, he's doing much worse, or she's doing much worse than I am. I'll be okay. I'll have to get through this." And they show up like mom and dad, but inside they're just they're, the families are getting torn apart. So I think these types of tools and having the therapists that are here and the, and the teachers that are here, being able to focus not just on the veterans, but send a flyer out to the community and find out where the moms and dads are. I guarantee you they'll be starting to show up. And if you start, if you start identifying with them as a group, as a tribe, you know, that it is a tribe. And they, and they pack together when they know about each other. So I would encourage you not just to focus on vets, of course, you know, but those family members are, are in desperate need of resources. So, so this is our interest as a training institute, as a teaching institute, um, looking at these different special interest groups. Veterans are a special interest group for us. And bringing like the two of you in so you can get training, so you can go out then and meet other vets, so it's vet to vet. Mm -hmm. You're bringing IRS to other vets as a vet. And then our other teachers who may reach out to the families, to the spouses, in that way, so we're really interested in this peer-to-peer -peer, um, strategy. Yeah. I think, as you're saying, that's really going to be the one that makes the difference. We can identify. I mean, Seth Godin, he's a marketing, brilliant marketing guy. He has a quote. He said, a crowd is simply a tribe without communication and leadership, but a tribe with communication and leadership is a movement. And that, that's really what we're talking about. There's 24 million living veterans in the United States, and if you multiply it, that number by spouses, children, mothers, fathers, grandparents, sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, you know, cousins, friends, coworkers, there's over 100 million people that are impacted directly or indirectly by homecoming. So there's a huge demographic out there. And as I was saying earlier, for the most part, people are suffering in silence. Especially if somebody dies from suicide, the entire family loses their identity as a military family. Like when my son passed away from a motorcycle accident, we can easily say, well, that was his way. He loved his motorcycle, and we still got his plaque on the wall, and everything is all noble, and he was a warrior, and he died. You know, and it just, it's he, he doing something he loved. We can at least say that. But with, with suicides, it's like the, the, the family just completely loses their identity. So they need the care and the tools even even more so than the, the families are, that are going through homecoming. Yeah, so we're looking at IRS as a, <clears throat> as a tool chest, as a set of self-care, self-management tools that mm -hmm. we can teach to people and we can also interact with them on a one-to-one -one or in a group situation. You mentioned this aspect of the helplessness that the parents, and you mentioned especially the moms, can feel when their son or their daughter has come home and they're wounded inside. They may not have an external wound, but they can feel that wound inside, and they don't know what to do. So they're feeling that sense of helplessness or hopelessness, as is the individual, the son mm -hmm. or the daughter. Yeah. And you know, you were commenting on coming home and this tremendous sense of separation, one from your unit. But what I've often heard is now they find themselves in their family unit but that sense of isolation and separation is very profound. The parent isn't able to help. The spouse may not know what to do. And so the situation can become very dire very quickly. They need homecoming preparedness resources. I just sat with somebody yesterday, uh, one of the folks in our, the ladies in the workshop, and she was talking about, you know, how, what, an, what is a, an example. And 
like most people wouldn't even think about this. If you have a veteran that's coming home and you go to a restaurant, go in ahead of time and look for a table. Or when you're going in with the veteran, look for a table in the back of the room, in the corner, so their back can be the wall and they can face everybody. You wouldn't think that that would be something that you would need to do. But with veterans, if their back is towards people they don't know, they're going to be real uncomfortable. And most families don't understand why can't you just settle down. And they'll be smoke, taking smoke breaks every three minutes. Or they'll just have to get up and leave. Or they'll just be really uncomfortable. But if you just were to go in and just find that si seat over there, make sure their back's in the corner, and always give them that seat, on a, almost on an unspoken level, they'll be saying, thank you, you get what I'm going through. So we're trying to create peer group to peer group, peer to peer in terms of, say, bringing this particular intervention I rest in. That's mm -hmm. part of what we're trying to do. That's why I'm, I'm really That's enjoying cool. you being here and you being here. You can take that work out. We're trying to create um, teachers who can go out there and work with the children, mm -hmm. work with the spouses, uh, because we're doing research. Because uh, one of your statistics I'm aware of is the divorce rate among uh, veterans, especially one who was deployed or if both deployed, are 65, 70, 75 percent. So we're trying to see if we can help ameliorate that divorce rate and bring in a better sense of resiliency among the, the married couple. But I also mm -hmm. think that's what we're trying to do with the families as well, the whole social network. Yeah. Well, there's one area that I really wanted to ask you about, Richard, which is that there's the, the standard is to give them meds. Like my son was on six meds a day for uh, PTSD, traumatic brain injury, irritable bowel, fibromyalgia, pain. He was addicted, you know, not addicted, but he was smoking a lot of pot because he just wanted to check out. Full-time student, dad, you know, husband, right? All the stuff to pack in. So he's self-medicating with pot every day just to not be here and to get along and cope, right? And um, a lot of vets are, are just turning to the bottle. They're turning to drugs, and they're getting addicted. They're getting addicted to pain meds, to opioids. They're, they're just going through all kinds of problems. They don't know how to get off of it. So you've done some high-rest work with uh, drug and alcohol re rehabilitation. Can you speak to some of the things you're doing there? Well, we've been doing research in, with chemical dependency. One of the things we've been told by veterans who've been going through our program is as they s stay in the group, they find they're cutting back on their meds. They're using less and less meds. The meds that they may need to stay on, then they're using less then. And many are saying they're going off their meds. So they're using less to control their pain because they're finding resources through the IRS methodology to work with their pain, uh, their depression, they're sleeping through the night. We've had a lot of reports, say, from uh, veterans from Vietnam. They say after their first IRS, I had the first night's sleep I've had since Vietnam. Uh, we're doing studies with traumatic brain injury, chronic pain, and post-traumatic stress, and we're getting the same feedback that they're not sure why, that's what their self-reports is, but they're sleeping through the night, they're using less meds, they're feeling uh, a better sense of their own self-esteem, so we're waiting to collate the actual results of the pre- and post-tests, but just coming off the cuff of these self-reports, that's what we're finding. Um, so you're right, I think of these as a series of self-care tools that people can utilize to manage their stress, to help ameliorate their stress, um, do things like help stop smoking. I think of it as an adjunctive program. It's not. It's. It can be a standalone program, but I think when it's combined with things like 12 steps or other programs, it's a highly effective mm -hmm. program. One of the ways that we're seeing it come into the VA, um, I was recently at a VA uh, where they have eight psychiatrists. Uh, each psychiatrist sees on average a patient for about a year, follows them for about a year, year and a half on a kind of a weekly or uh, bi-weekly basis, but they're getting 65 to 80 referrals per week. Mm -hmm. They're totally overwhelmed. And so one of the things we were saying is by instituting a group like iREST, we can help that transition period before they're able to get perhaps that one-to-one -one care. Now they're in a peer group. They c can start learning these kind of self-management tools that can then support the work of the psychiatrists or the mental health workers or we're coming into palliative care, we're coming into the cancer wards, the amputee wards, the burn units. 
uh, one of the things we also see is not just, as you're saying, the vet, but the families, mm -hmm. but also the healthcare workers themselves because they're getting vicarious PTSD in treating uh, the vets. So we're also looking at our program as how do we help the healthcare workers uh, with keeping their joy in what they're doing and they're sleeping well at night so they're enthused to keep going and do the work that they're needing to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I see IRES's use in a lot of different ways. I was telling the story the other day, uh, a couple of Marines came into um, one of the VA centers where we had one of our teachers and she's also a yoga teacher and so she was teaching a yoga class letting them know that they had yoga, and they said, well, we don't want yoga, we want eye rest. Mm -hmm. And she said, I teach eye rest, and they said, no way. Yeah. And so they found themselves uh, in, a, in a nice moment of being able to find a group that was set for them. So I'm enthused. We're, we're starting to come into many VA centers. We're also coming into active duty sites like Camp Lejeune and other places around the country. Um, I think the more we can come in, the more benefit we're going to see in these places like working with the drugs, uh, helping people cut back on their medications and find that there are other ways that they can uh, heal than just through the meds. Well, I, I think if there's a vision for the future, it would be to have in three to five years with the right commitments, just like William was saying with battlefield medicine, you know, we can have a world-class best practices decompression model for especially for combat and combat related job specialties before these men and women are getting ready to come home and in the years to come by having a successful model imagine what it would be like to teach these self-care tools going through boot camp and basic training where you're teaching the warrior ultimately how to self-regulate you know you're talking about a homecoming program I'd like to see these kinds of best practices integrated, as you say, right from the very beginning. So they're getting that skill, not at the end, but right at the very beginning. They're using that skill all the way through their service. And so they're seeing the impact of it moment to moment or day to day. And so when they come out, they're not being taught that skill. They already have that skill, and then that skill is being reinforced. So I would love to see these kinds of best practices integrated right from the very beginning. I think the work that, uh, that you've been uh, uh, doing in, in the schools is, is, a, is another area. For a active duty military bases, their children with deployed parents and having to go through it. I, I remember growing up when my dad was deployed and like, you know, looking around and, you know, that was just kind of the normal thing. But so he didn't really want to talk about it in order to reopen any of those wounds. But there's so many kids having their, you know, their fathers and mothers that, that are gone. And uh, I, I believe that by teaching IRS to these children, and building resiliency in that way, uh, it, it will help strengthen the family. And uh, you know, so I, I think that's a, another very, very promising avenue. Right. We'd like to, and we're trying to do that, institute in the recreational centers on bases mm -hmm. so the spouse who's at home and their children can have access to these kind of programs. So they're building that resiliency in. So they're dealing with their stress while the other spouse is deployed and they're being able to handle that and then they've got that resiliency to better handle that mm. homecoming themselves. Yeah, because what I've seen with, uh, especially with soldiers that have uh, multiple children who have older children, right, the, the older child will have, to, will have to fill that role and it, it's not fair or healthy to them in their, in their development. And so to have another program that, that, can, that can help the family holistically, it'll be a, a much better returning environment for the veteran when he gets home. And then hopefully they can teach him that skill, right? Like you, like you had said, the, the children teaching their parents these skills. And I think that's what's most promising about integrative restoration is that anybody can do it, you know? Uh, and Probably the children are, are better than the adults, you know, when it comes to that sort of thing. So, so I, I like the idea of having this image of when a soldier is going through boot camp, their spouse gets a package, their parents get a package. They're already starting this uh, post-deployment uh, preparation right at the very beginning. But 
it's something that the whole uh, family, the whole support system is being tapped into. Mm -hmm. There's a particular spot in the homecoming, the phases of homecoming, where I think this is especially important. And there's, there's five stages. There's the anticipation stage, which starts even before the person is deployed. They can't wait for them to get home, right? Then there's the reunion phase, where there's obviously the big celebration. Then there's the realization of changes phase, which happens in seconds or minutes, probably not days, but there's a huge realization that people are different. This person's changed from their experiences, and like the, the guy comes home and his wife's managing the checkbook and everything's all good and the screen door's fixed and he's no longer needed. You know, or, or the, 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 the woman comes home from, from deployment and there's other issues going on with the dad and family. And so you've got that realization of changes phase when the family's looking at the vet, the vet's looking at the family. And then you've got the acceptance of changes phase, which comes right on the heels of it. And it can last a long time. And if they make it through that, they get to the new normal. The challenge is, is the, the realization of changes and the acceptance of changes is where we're losing relationships. So keeping our vets alive and keep them, keeping families together is really the big challenge at that particular point. So vets having self-care tools, more resiliency, the ability to manage their state and their emotions when they get triggered, and the families being able to hold a bigger space than what's going on. I'd love to take a few moments and see if we have any questions or reflections from the people who are listening in. So I'd love to pass the mic around and see if we do have any questions or comments. It's interesting to me because I've worked a lot with uh, brain injury and a lot of these uh, soldiers have a lot of brain injury, a lot of comorbid uh, disorders are going on at the same time. And up in Anchorage, there was a rash of um, spousal, um, I guess, homicides on base. Um, and the pattern was that the spouses were found strangled in the backyard or the front yard. And so the pattern kind of went like this. You know, the spouse would start yelling at the, the military member who had come back, you know, about why are you acting like this? Why aren't you talking? And so on and so forth. And the military member retreats, um, trying to avoid the situation. The spouse pursues. The military member goes outside, the spouse pursues, and and the spouse starts yelling, and what do you do to get somebody to stop yelling? You strangle them. And so there was a lot of talk about, you know, what's the problem? Is it because they're brain injured, they don't understand, there's cognitive problems, are they oversensitive to sound? Um, those type of things, which comes along with brain injury. But it seems to me that it's this self-regulation piece, and that's why I'm here to, to learn about iRest, because it's really about self-regulation and being present is really what the problem is, whether it's PTSD, brain injury, alcohol, drug abuse. It's about being present, being mindful. And um, so I think that's – I see iRest as a very fundamental piece to this. These other, and It's true that it's, it's an adjunct of therapy, but it's really getting at the base of this fundamental problem and the medications and so forth can help deal with some of those symptoms, but if we start with something like eye rest, I think we can avoid a lot of that other inter interaction with other medications and those problems. Well, you're also bringing up the point which we were talking about earlier, which is the um, teaching these skills to the veteran with, say, TBI and helping them learn how to self-regulate. And we do know the plasticity of the brain, even if it's been injured, can change and grow, and they can learn a lot of these skills. But I also hear that by putting these tools in the hands of the spouse, then we might not see that pursue um, kind of behavior that they're beginning to understand what the response they need to do and how they may be reacting. And so by taking themselves also self-regulating, we can intervene on what otherwise becomes a very dangerous and deadly situation. Yeah. Um, as a VA psychologist, or in kind of, I see myself kind of growing up through my practice in VA because I've been since the beginning of my graduate training at VA in a lot of different departments: polytrauma, trauma services, uh, do neuropsychology, so tra brain injury, and you know, the psychological assessment, the intervention, and all these other areas I can see this as having such a great impact in all kinds of areas, whether it be in cognition issues, whether it be in trauma services, whether it be in general mental health issues, substance abuse, it can really integrate anywhere and, and be really fluid. 
um, one thing I was thinking of commenting on is um, just the amount of red tape it takes to cut through the system. What we're doing um, in the civilian sector to to address this is, I mean, the parents that I talk to, we don't talk about religion or politics. We talk about what's going on, you know, with our kids and our family members. And so, you know, it's it's pretty basic when you there's nothing more more committed than a uh, than a, a a parent protecting their offspring of any species, right? And so you've got all these parents, and the same consistent story that's surfacing is the recruiter told us that they were going to bring our kids home better than they found them, right? They'd be better contributors to society. Mm -hmm. And so you've got, you've got all these families who are suffering in silence or, or individually, but yet when they start hearing a good message, which seems like we've developed a pretty straightforward strategy, it's almost like we want to have a big parent-teacher sit-down conference with the DOD and the, and the VA and everybody and just say, look, we're failing. We don't know what to do. And we think by having, I mean, at 22 veterans a day dying from suicide, that's 8,000 a year. You know, you multiply that out times a number of years, just that number alone, 20 or 30,000 family members saying, you know, we've already lost our kids. We need to do something different, make, make our kids' lives mean something, right? combined with all the other vets families that are that are going through all kinds of terrible challenges we think by having 20 30 100 200,000 you know families together that we will have a strong enough voice that it won't be about this paralyzed system i mean and we get asked all the time well the va doesn't work this way or the dod doesn't work that way well who created a system i mean with the right right influence with people with the voting power um maybe there is an opportunity to reshuffle the deck. Yeah. And to kind of piggyback on that point, um, there's over 3,500 veterans or organizations out there. And if they all got together and focused on one thing that everyone knows is wrong and, 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 and stood up in a united voice and said, hey, listen, we don't know what to do, but we know something's wrong and we know that there are people that have ideas on what to do. Just quickly, that... My spouse was a journalist in Afghanistan, so this this situation I think is similar. And I was the spouse that was pursuing mm. and didn't understand and didn't have language, and was very fearful. And what I am now realizing is that the numbness that he experienced and tried so hard on day in and day out to describe to me, and then the violence around the, the numbness, um, definitely triggered so much anxiety in me and I started to act in violent ways that I never knew I could act and it was that pursuer chaser and what I'm now realizing is that that numbness was there for a reason and my anxiety was there for a reason and they were messengers and I didn't know what the message was and I kept misinterpreting it and um, and that is unfortunate because numbness and anxiety that you were feeling and that he was feeling was perfectly understandable. And I judged it. And I got mad at his feelings. And I wanted to change him. And, and um, he wanted to change me and fix me. And how many times did he say to me, Misha, stop trying to fix me, God damn it. You're trying to fix me, and you're trying to change me, and you're reading all those goddamn books. Get those books out of this house. I feel like I'm an alien, and you're trying to fix me. And I just wanted him to hug me, and I wanted him to hold his child, and he couldn't hold his child, and he still can't hold his child. He still can't spend more than one or two um, days with his child before the violence starts coming. And I know he's in pain, and now I... And blessed because I can go home and maybe um, hold space for his numbness and not judge it and I just want to say well I'm sorry to him and I'm sorry that um, mm, I hope one day we'll be able to hold space for you because you deserve to be held and um, and and uh, we need to learn how to support you and and it's um, it's a beautiful journey to be on, and so I just want to say that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, you know, I, I've, uh, I've, I've done, done the traditional soldier's tale. I've ruined a couple marriages in the same way. And I, I've heard things like, uh, well, things are so much better when you just kept it all inside. Right, like every th- the household was good when you just kept everything and kept those barriers. But wh- what I couldn't convey to them, and what they couldn't understand, was the more I put up those barriers, the 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 more pressure came behind it. And when those walls come down, it it, it, it comes hard. And uh, like what I believe with you, and and in my case, I knew that they were coming out of a place of love. Like their frustration was coming out of a, of of a of a caring place. But sometimes you're just not ready to receive that, and you don't know how, and, and you're scared to open that up. You're, you're scared to, to, let the, to let that floodgate go and to say, okay, you know, it, it goes again. So it's kind of counterintuitive, right? The, I love you so much that I'm so mad that you won't do this. And, and, and I, I think a lot, of, a lot of military families can relate to what you were saying there. So thank you for sharing. This is just a comment. Um, I was married to a Navy pilot, and this was, he was a pilot um, in the 70s and 80s. And we went through deployments, um, six-month deployments. Um, I can still feel uh, the emotional response to it with little children. And um, I mean, they would really, there was no email. There were no um, Skype. There was no Skyping. There was a passage of letters that never, uh, you know, he would be um, trying to solve some problem, and then it would be already solved by the time they got the letter, and then they responded back, and then, and then there were phone, um, there were phone um, uh, stations where they would have to stand in line for nine hours mm-hmm. to make a phone call, not even knowing that their family members were going to be able. To to get the phone, or you didn't know the phone call was coming. And in all of that, there was never any preparation for the leaving or the coming. There was never a a community. There was not a, um, um, there were no conversations about coming and going. Mm -hmm. People would just disappear and then reappear. And so I am just sitting here in awe that the conversation is even happening. I mean, that Mm. is, first off, amazing that the conversation, that this conversation is taking place and that the idea that, um, and the um, imagination I mean, it would have been beyond my imagination, but that the imagination and that people are being given skills and that is going to happen and that the conversation is happening, it to me is a miracle mm-hmm. in itself. Yeah, and I'd love to comment on it that's taking place at so many levels. I've been invited to the State Department to give this kind of presentation because they're interested, because they're seeing their embassies, their embassies coming back with post-traumatic stress. They're wondering how do we integrate these kind of programs. I know that the current administration is very interested in these kinds of programs uh, and how do they implement them into all the different segments of the uh, U.S. government. Um, I've been at White House functions where we've had people from um, Dean Ornish with the Integrative Health Program, uh, Cabot Zinn, myself, Department of Defense. this is a conversation that is really happening at a lot of different levels. So I, I love that we're having it here, but to me this is just representative of what I'm participating in everywhere. I'm part of a military mind-body consortium where we're looking at what are best practices and we've been invited to be a consortium where then the military comes to us rather than somebody in a back room deciding what the best practice is and they don't have any idea about these practices. And I think that's wonderful. Like, and that's what John Henry and I, I talk about when we were stu- when we were having the discussion on on starting chapters of Purple Star all across the country. Because then you have the macro element covered, and then you have the micro element, the organic grassroots. So it, it's being handled from from the bottom up and from the top down. 
and then we all meet in the middle and hopefully have a solution. And there are decompression programs in place. The Canadian military has a wonderful uh, decompression program on the island of Cyprus, where at, where before they come home, uh, they go to they go to Cyprus and they have uh, they have clinicians on there, but they they kind of uh, format it as a as a little mini vacation just to calm down. They receive some mental health treatment. Uh, the USC School of Social Work and the Center for Integrational Research for Military Veterans and Families. That's a mouthful. Uh, they, uh, <laughs> they, they've, they've gone over there and, and, and done some, some wonderful research and, and given them pointers. And uh, so it, it's, it's wonderful to see that these programs are starting to be implemented and that, uh, that ideas are, are coming from all over the place, from, from civilians and, and, like you said, uh, heads of state. And to touch on your, qu uh, on your comment, um, on the initial invasion uh, in, in Iraq, I remember getting like one satellite phone call a month for five minutes. Uh, that, that's, all, that's all we had. And then when you have a baby or something, you know, you kind of go with that. And then going there afterwards, you know, with the in, uh, uh, invention of Skype and everything else, the accessibility of that technology, um, it was almost worse, right? Because people, what I found, at least in my own experience, is people were giving me their problems from the United States, and really they didn't know that day I just, uh, I've, I kicked in 50 doors that day, and, I, and I'm super tired, and there's all kinds of things, and there could have been IED blast, and, and, and whatever what was going on, but I can't tell them that, and they're trying to unload stuff on me, and then... In, even on days where it was good, it was, there was still a sense of, there was still a sense of, like, now I can't be here. I can't be here in this work because I see, I see my family and I, and I start to miss them. And then it, it kind of clouds everything and, and puts a damper on the day. So uh, I'm not sure if, if the technology is, is that beneficial. I know it may be in moderation, but uh, I, I had some difficulty and I know a lot of other guys did too. You know, just, and it all comes back to lack of education. They didn't know. They were just having a conversation about what was going on. And really, you're sitting there going, I'm in a war. <laughs> like, you know, I, I'm in a war. But, you know, they, they're just trying to relate, the re the re relate their daily experience. And you're just helpless. You can't do anything about it. So, you know, sometimes technology can be, can be a blessing and a curse all in the, all in the same time. Uh, John Henry and William, I just wanted to know what we could do right now to help you in your very noble goal? Well, right now we have about roughly 8,000 signatures. We started the petition in September against the, the, uh, the heavy protest from a media advisor saying, what are you doing in the middle of an election, right? You're launching this petition. We're like, well, we're not going to be talking to any politicians. We want to talk to families. And so throughout the election period, just through word of mouth, it was just trickling in and we didn't do anything uh, formally, any advertising or anything throughout the inauguration either. So we got about 8,000 signatures right now on a petition. And it's on change.org. And if you go to purplestarfamilies.org, you can see what we're doing very clearly. And uh, what I like about it is we've got 8,000 signatures and we have not one single email or phone call criticizing the message, criticizing what we're doing. And as, as William said, there's 3,500 organizations out there. We don't want to replicate it and be another yet well-intending nonprofit that wants to help. We, we don't want to duplicate anything anybody's doing. We want to bring attention to the good things that they're doing. But what we want to do is focus on policies, policy change. And so we feel with 8,000 signatures and no complaints, we've done an effective test market. The message is resonating. About half the people of those 8,000 are actually giving us their contact information. So now we're starting to build a database of those sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, grandparents, and they're telling us we want to be contacted. We want this to be successful. And about 10% are actually leaving heartfelt comments as to why they're signing it. You know, my dad died from suicide. My husband died from suicide. My uncle's still suffering from Vietnam. And I mean, you just get on change.org and look at the all the all the comments, and you'll start getting a flavor of people want this to be successful and we have a bad day all we have to do is get on the survey and look at who just signed it eight hours ago and why they signed it and it's just like okay we're we're in the fight we're still going and you know and people want it to be successful so our request would be that you go to purplestarfamilies.org if you're in, and there's a little link that has a video you can watch a little bit more about what we're doing and then there's a link that says sign the petition 
If you like what we're doing, sign the petition and send it out to everybody you know, because chances are it may not be you that's a center of influence, but somebody you know might be a huge center of influence. And we feel like it's probably ready for national exposure, where if we have one good interview, like what we're doing right here and right now, this conversation, if we did this in some form of larger media, uh, it doesn't have to be William or I. We could, we, there's several people that are on board with us that could actually have the interview that we feel like that would just go logarithmic. And we're going for a million signatures, but I really think that if we just got a couple of hundred thousand signatures with this kind of message, it's so straightforward, it's so clear. We're not asking for the moon. We're just, you know, we're shooting for what's realistic. And we think that sitting down with the Office of the President, the DOD, the VA, um, some civilian sector organizations, that if there was an ability to vet the nonprofits and the, and the healing modalities that are getting results, you know, that we will find a model. It won't be today. We're not saying we demand it today. We're saying that we have to start today. We have to create an expedition into brain research and into trauma and into TBI, and we need to start today. So that way in three to five years we've got something. But if we don't start today, it's just going to continue to spiral out of control. So that's how you can help. Sign the petition and tell your friends. Thank you. Well, thank you, William. Thank you, uh, John Henry. And uh, I look forward to the petition signatures rolling. <laughs> mm. okay. thank, you. Thank, you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Mm. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone.